So to start, I'll talk a little bit about terminology, um, because I think it's important to understand some of the terms that families will encounter from the medical literature. When we talk about chromosomes, we're talking about the structure that carries DNA. So DNA encodes our genes or our genetic information that tells our bodies how to grow and how to develop. And so the chromosomes are the structures that carry those, that DNA. When we talk about the term aneuploidy, we're talking about additional or missing chromosomes in the cell. So sex chromosome aneuploidies or SCAs are additional or missing chromosomes that are specific to the X or Y chromosomes. And when we talk about sex chromosome trisomies, we're talking about the presence of three sex chromosomes in the cell. And the common conditions that we talk about when we're talking about these trisomies are Klinefelter syndrome, XXY, Jacob syndrome, XYY, or trisomy X syndrome, or XXX. And from a, a group of conditions, there's a lot of different terms that are used, but they're really all the same when we're talking about the group of conditions. So the scientific term that's most commonly used is sex chromosome aneuploidy, and you'll see this a lot in medical journal articles. But they can also be referred to as sex chromosome abnormalities, anomalies, disorders, or variations. And then people will also talk about X and Y chromosome aneuploidies, or X and Y chromosome variations, and that's really the term that I hear most often preferred by families and really is more specific, but a little less scientific in, in the use of that term in the medical literature. But for the most part, these all refer to the same group of conditions. And when we're talking about X and Y chromosome variations, there's a lot of different types of variations. So X, Y, Y being one of many different types of variations. You can see the larger circles are depicting really the trisomies because they tend to be more common, but we can see having multiple extra copies of X's and Y's that can occur in our patients and we can see more commonly in our clinic. Combined, sex chromosome aneuploidies occur in about one in 400 live births, with the most common being XXY, or Klinefelter syndrome. Jacob syndrome, or XYY, occurs in about one in 1,000 males that are born, which is equal to trisomy X, or girls that are born with an extra X chromosome. And when we think about the history and the background leading into XYY, in 1956, Dr. Patricia Jacobs identified the presence of extra chromosomes in individuals with XYY. So she really led the charge in being able to identify and stain chromosomes that could be visualized with the microscope. In the 1970s, newborn screening studies were initiated and went into the 1980s that really started to describe the impact of having these extra X, X or Y chromosomes in individuals. And today, if we search PubMed in the medical literature for XYY, we find a total of 847 results. So 847 medical articles that have been published since the very beginning relative to other genetic conditions is very small. And we have a lot of work to do around researching and publishing and educating what XYY means and how it can impact an individual. The highest year of publication was in 2020, probably secondary to COVID, um, where there, there, there were 36 publications in a single year, but we really have our work cut out for us because we need to do, we need to do more. So how is XYY identified? Well, what, a lot of what we know about XYY um, is based on individuals who were identified to have it, but that really only represents about 10% of all individuals with XYY. So the majority of men with an extra Y chromosome go their entire lifetime without actually knowing that they have this. And the more common indications of identifying the extra Y chromosome is when genetic testing is ordered secondary to either global developmental delays, low muscle tone or hypotonia in infancy especially, 
or autism. So these are all indications to do genetic testing in an individual and in clinic. But some of the more common features, especially things like ADHD, that we can see more often in our patients with XYY actually don't trigger the order of genetic testing. And so while these individuals who go undiagnosed may be symptomatic, um, they're not necessarily reported accurately in the literature. But today we're starting to learn a lot more. So in 2013, non-invasive prenatal screening or NIPS was introduced. And this is a, a, um, a technique in which there's a blood test that's offered during pregnancy. So it's considered non-invasive because it's a test of mother's blood that is analyzing fetal fragments of DNA naturally in the blood originating from the placenta of the developing fetus. And so by studying the fetal fragments of DNA, we're able to screen to see if a pregnancy has an increased risk of having an, a, the presence of an extra chromosome such as XYY. This is a test that's also commonly referred to as cell-free DNA testing. Um, it was recommended in 2020 by the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists that it be offered to all women regardless of age um, during pregnancy. It's a test that's commonly offered at 10 weeks or later gestation, and that's because the fetal fraction or the concentration of the fetal fragments in maternal blood is high enough to be able to test at that stage or later in pregnancy. The results you can get from the screening test can show either an increased risk with a positive result, no increased risk identified with a negative result, or inconclusive, most often attributed to fetal fraction not being high enough. And there's a lot of variable methodologies that the labs are using in, in initiating and doing non-invasive prenatal screening. So not all labs are created equal from their approach. When we look at a recent publication from the American College of Medical Genetics in 2023, and they did a meta-analysis of 28 different studies looking at the um, sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value, which is the ability that a, a positive screening result is a true positive diagnosis in the individual, they reported that in XYY, the positive predictive value was approximately 74%. And so that ranged anywhere from 58% to 85%. But this really highlights that this screening is not a diagnostic test. And it really does require that follow-up testing at some point be conducted in order to confirm if it's a true positive or a false positive. It's also important to keep in mind that discordance results are possible, and we've seen this through our clinic. And so what that translates to is that a positive screening result followed by diagnostic testing could identify an abnormal diagnosis that's different from the original screening results. So when we have a positive screen, the options that we have in pursuing diagnostic genetic testing um, are either prenatal or postnatal. So prenatally, the two options are either a chorionic villus sample um, that is done, it's called CVS as well, and it's done at 10 to 13 weeks gestation where they take a sample of the placenta and analyze the chromosomes. The other prenatal testing option is amniocentesis where they take a sample of fluid from around the developing fetus um, and that they test that sample or the cells in that sample to look for the presence of an extra chromosome. And that test can be done at 15 weeks or later during gestation. About half the time, families will defer to having the test done postnatally after the baby is born. And this can be done either by a blood test, such as a cord blood test or a cheek swab, where they use a brush to collect some cheek cells um, from inside the mouth or a saliva sample in order to be able to analyze the chromosomes. And the analysis is either by karyotype or chromosomal microarray. So a karyotype is a study of the chromosomes by staining the chromosomes in a cell in order to count the chromosomes present, as well as 
study the structure of the individual chromosomes with the banding pattern. And when they take the chromosomes from a single cell and organize them into a karyotype, they put them in their respective pairs. They go from pair number one, numbered to pair number 22, from largest to smallest. And then the 23rd pair is, is our sex chromosomes, labeled either with an X or a Y. We have pairs of chromosomes because we get one chromosome in each pair from each parent. So one from the egg and the mother, and one from the father, one from the mother and the father, and so forth and so on. When there's a Y chromosome present, it carries the genes that drive male development. In the absence of the Y chromosome, females will develop and typically have two X chromosomes. When a karyotype is conducted that's diagnostic for XYY, we see two Y chromosomes present in the cell. So instead of having the typical 23 pairs or 46, we see an extra chromosome that's represented by 47 and that extra chromosome being Y. That's diagnostic for XYY. The other way we can diagnose XYY and, and uh, chromosomal aneuploidies is with a chromosomal microarray. So a microarray is a study of the chromosome using microscopic probes that attach along the length of each chromosome. And we see that we have pairs of chromosomes and they're represented as balanced along this red line in which we're looking in a microarray for either a duplication or extra material or a deletion or missing material along the length of the chromosome. Now this illustration is specific to the X chromosome having extra material, but what we would see in XYY is instead of the X being extra or represented as having more material than we would anticipate, we would see this with Y in which we see the concentration of the Y chromosome being twice of what we would anticipate in a typical XY male. So what causes XYY? XYY results from the chromosomes failing to divide properly during cell division. And this typically is with the formation of the sperm from a male. So during cell division that leads to formation of sperm, if the Y chromosomes fail to separate when making the sperm, they can result in having two Y chromosomes in a single sperm, and that fertilization can have XYY as a diagnosis in the developing um, fetus. This is not, the, not caused by something that the father would have done either before or during pregnancy or in college. This is not his fault. It's just a biological mechanism that can occur um, relatively common in formation of sperm as well as eggs, but not in this condition, um, in just the human population. There's a lot of variation that we can see among individuals with XYY, and especially going back to my comment previously that 90% of the time these individuals are not identified during their lifetime. So there's a lot of variability that we can see in physical features, a lot of variability in development, in medical features, and in psychological features, such as learning and behaviors. But when we look at the overlapping features that we can see, in comparing XYY to the other trisomy conditions, whether it's trisomy X in females or XXY, we see commonalities as far as neurodevelopmental risks that we can see. So we know that individuals with XYY are at risk of having developmental delays. They're at risk for having learning disabilities, more, common, more commonly language-based learning disabilities. We see increased risk for ADHD, executive dysfunction, anxiety disorders, social communication or autism, and motor skills disorders. We can also see that from a learning disabilities perspective, that the language disorders and reading disabilities or dyslexia can be more common. And that's because the verbal skills that we see tend to be weaker than the nonverbal skills when we're looking at the overall tendencies in the test outcomes of individuals that we're following. From a medical and physical perspective, we can see that XYY is associated with taller stature, 
um, of a couple inches taller than what we would anticipate compared to parental heights. We see no difficulty as far as hormone or reproductive problems that are common. Um, we can see unexpectedly some testosterone deficiency, so we do monitor puberty, but we don't tend to commonly associate this condition with having hormone problems. And then the presence of birth defects or congenital malformations is rare in the sense that there's no more increased risk in this population compared to the general population. So in perspective, it's really important to keep in mind that XYY is highly variable, that our family background genes and the environment in which we're raised can play a significant role in our outcomes that we can see um, kids that are identified early and parents who are empowered to take a proactive approach can also have an impact on outcomes, whether that's getting involved with interventions early or being proactive about getting learning evaluations, going into academic years. All of the proactive approaches can also impact, positively impact outcomes. And it's also important to keep in mind that children are individuals. And while they may have an extra Y chromosome in this condition, that they still have their own unique individuality, their own unique strengths and their own unique weaknesses, just like other individuals. And we see a lot of beautiful strengths in the patients that we follow in our clinic. I'm not gonna go into it too much, but I just wanna highlight the fact that Genetic counselors can help families in many other ways. So that can be planning next steps after a new diagnosis is made, identifying whether or not symptoms that are being experiences, experienced are attributed to the diagnosis or potentially not attributed to the diagnosis in which further evaluation may be indicated. They're able to assist families in disclosure of the diagnosis, whether that's to the child or to other family members or to the school, especially advocating for school services, um, and help really advocating and understanding how to navigate if school services, such as special education or individualized educational plans would be indicated. Genetic counselors are great in helping families navigate healthcare resources as well as talking through the individual needs and, and transitioning to adulthood, and then connecting to community resources. And that can be pediatric resources, as well as adult resources. And then talking to individuals in regard to recurrence risk, whether that's future pregnancies for the, the parents of the individual or the individual himself. There's a lot of resources that are available through the AXIS website, genetic.org, whether it's this recorded talk or other recorded talks from previous conferences, as well as published materials. There's a great book by Virginia Cover talking about XYY, um, as well as XXY and Trisomy X. And then our, our website for our clinic, the extraordinarykidsclinic.org, has a lot of published medical journal articles and resources available as well. And we've published a series of children's books on Amazon that are available for purchase, um, Jack and his Extra Y, and we're working on um, developing and publishing soon some additional resources through Amazon that'll be available for families of a prenatal diagnosis or new diagnosis and a newborn. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions and I thank you for your time.